really grateful to have Jenny Robinson with us this week, a uh, really accomplished printmaker. I'll just go through maybe just a, a couple of little bullet points off the, the CV here because it's incredibly long. Uh, Jenny's a member of the Royal Society of Painter Printmakers, the Los Angeles Printmaking Society, and the Boston Printmakers. She was awarded the uh, Fellowship Award uh, in Venezia, Italy, uh, the, Paint, uh, the Print Center's Honorary Council Award of Excellence in Philadelphia, USA, the Otis Philbrick Purchase Award uh, in 2015 from Boston, Massachusetts, and her work has also been exhibited in uh, the US, South Korea, Canada, um, and many places within Europe. So I'm really glad to have Jenny here with us today to talk. So whenever you're ready, Jenny, go ahead. Stay in. Okay, well, um, hello. Thank, I want to thank the Center of Fine Print Research Seminars for inviting me today. Um, for this presentation, I'd like to focus on my work from the past decade and talk about how big life changes like moving continents can affect and change your work to reflect these new locations and experiences. But first, a little bit of background about where I grew up. Um, I grew up in Borneo, where my father was an engineer building roads through the jungle. At eight, I was sent back to boarding school in England, and that I went um, and did my degree in printmaking in the UK, where I spent much of my 20s. After college, I went backpacking around the world, so travel and the change that comes with it has always been part, a normal part of my life. But I really want to concentrate on two moves that have specifically influenced and changed my art practice. In 2000, I moved from London with my husband and two small boys to San Francisco, where I have lived until 2018, at which point we decided to move back to Europe for two years while I was still a European. We chose to live in Slovenia with easy access, until the pandemic at least, to the UK, and we are due to fly back to the States in four weeks. My move to America exposed me to a whole new visual landscape, especially since my studio there is based in an old naval shipyard in an area of post-industrial decline, populated by massive structures and abandoned architecture. Since my work has always been a reaction to and informed by my immediate surroundings, this location gave me an endless supply of inspiration right on my doorstep. At this time, I also enjoyed um, I also joined the Kalar Institute of Art in Berkeley, California, an amazing printmaking AIR program where for the first time I had access to a press large enough for me to be able to make prints on a scale that reflected my subject matter. This press that you can see here is one that I work on all the time. It's a French tool press. The bonus of working in a communal setting like Kalar's is that you're exposed to artists of all ages and from all countries, all working in different ways. And the exchange of ideas and methods is a really invaluable resource. I just want to talk a little bit about my process because I, I work sort of outside of the traditional um, methods of printmaking that I was taught at college. I've always wanted to work with non-toxic materials um, while still achieving the same quality of textures and tonal variations available in traditional printmaking like etchings. I started experimenting with techniques before I left the UK to make dry points on cardboard substrates, which allowed me to make much larger plates in my studio and to make them much faster than it would take to make a traditional etching of that size but without the need for any toxic materials. I would then take the plates to Kalar to print, making small varied additions, which suits this technique, as the cardboard plates only hold up for five or six prints. I wipe each plate differently, adding layers of transparent monotype underneath to create unique prints within the additions. My work during this first decade in America revolved mostly around depicting singular monolithic structures that reflected my interest in how time and the environment impact the often ignored and unseen infrastructures around us. The cardboard plates have a more gritty and textural quality to them than tradition, traditional etching on copper does. So I found that the process reflected not only the subject matter, 
but the physical tactile quality of the final print itself. Um, I'm often asked why I, I'm drawn to structural imagery. Both my father and grandfather were engineers, and I suppose I'm naturally hardwired to appreciate the structural aspect of things and to be curious about how things are made and what lies beneath and behind the surfaces of the facades around us. That's why bridges and buildings that are in a state of construction or deconstruction interest me because they are laid bare like bones or skeletons, frameworks open to view. Oops, sorry, I've gone forward. Over several years, I worked on a series of billboard images in and around San Francisco. Driving around the Bay Area, I was bombarded by images of billboards, cranes, scaffolding, which often looked like pencil drawings backlit against the sky. And these strong impressions led to a more visually pared down and linear approach to my drawings and prints. After a while, I started cutting up, weaving and reassembling my prints and taking a less precious approach to the finished work. The first time I did this, it felt a bit like sacrilege, but I quickly got over that and embraced this new approach of creating one of a kind prints within the editions. I started to deconstruct and manipulate my prints in order to make works that were larger and more technically, technically complex. This print was the first print where I really cut up elements of the paper and stuck it all back together again and it was the largest print to date that i would made and it and it sort of led to a freeing up of self-imposed constraints and gave me the freedom to cut collage seam the work together in order to extend the scale um, which reflected the subject matter matter much better i felt So I was quite influenced by many of the artists I was working with at Kalar. Um, you know, people worked with different substrates and different papers, and it made me start to think about how my choices of material could conceptually push, question, or complement the finished work. And by selecting materials that would create a juxtaposition, juxtaposition between the subject matter and its substrate became quite central to the work that I was making. By choosing Japanese papers such as Gampi, which is a tissue thin paper whose fragile translucency belies its strength, my images took on a weightlessness that created a perfect counterbalance for these monolithic images, which seem indestructible, but are in fact themselves ultimately fragile. And the paper is fragile, or seems to be fragile, but is also extremely strong and durable. So it was a nice sort of balance between the two things. Hangar One, this, this print actually marked the start of a new body which took me in a completely new direction. I originally made this print as a small sketch so that I could experiment with working on different types of Japanese paper. The image is based on a huge airship hangar just outside San Francisco, and it's been stripped of its outer shell, um, and it sits in the middle of a huge NASA airfield, and it looks like a massive dinosaur skeleton. Um, and it, this monolith seemed to encapsulate the very ideas of fragility and strength and the passage of time that I'm interested in my work. And my multiple visits here led to a really, you know, to almost a love affair with this building. I, I just thought it was amazing. So once I started working on these very fine and thin Japanese paper, this is Gampi in this video. I realized that I really didn't have a clue how to handle them properly, how to dampen them when I was working on such a large scale, um, and generally what to do with them once I'd printed them because they were on such fine, thin paper. So, sorry, yeah. So I, um, I contacted an artist called Paul Maloney 
who some of you may have heard of. Um, he's an artist and publisher in San Francisco who's now moved to Portland, I think. Um, he spent years in Japan learning about backing and seeming Japanese papers together. So he's quite an expert. Um, and I asked him if he would teach me how to deal with Gampi and how to seam it and back it and preserve it, really. Um, so he he taught us this. Um, I got a group of friends together and he he taught us how to to back and seam in the Japanese traditional way. Um, and his workshop really had a huge impact on the way I thought about my choices of materials. Um, I loved, I really loved learning the traditional skills going back thousands of years and finding new ways to incorporate them into a more contemporary practice. Um, it, it literally takes a village to work on a sheet of paper that's about 100 centimeters by 150. Uh, you need about six people. Um, so it's it's tricky, but it's really lovely way to work. This print was part of a series I call experimental constructs, and it was the first print using the new techniques I'd learned from Paul Maloney, where I expanded on whole or partial parts of an existing structure so that they became more visually ambiguous while still grounded in my direct visual response to my surroundings and the drawings I'd done at the time. This piece is the largest piece I've done on Gampi so far. And again, it's based on um, taking sections of the Hangar One building. Um, and because Gampi can be read from both sides when it's printed, it's a paper that allows for making much larger scale work from smaller plates by seaming together and tessellating multiple panels. So concentrating on one just section, just one section of the hangar building, I made an intricate dry point and printed it multiple times on Gampi. Um, I just made one plate and then printed it multiple times. Once the panels um, are seen together, the whole print is back with Sekishu paper, which is a slightly thicker paper um, that stabilizes the print and holds it together. Uh, this is the finished image. Um, so these new methods of construction that I had learnt allow have allowed me since then the freedom to think in terms of making unique oversized works that are no longer limited by the size of the equipment available in any one place. Because often when you move around, you go to residencies, um, their equipment is very different from the equipment that you're used to. So it's a way of continuing to make big work, even though your equipment may be um, on a much smaller scale. From, from here on in, I started making a series of large prints um, tiling and tessellating elements of the same image together. Um, and I also became really interested in mimicking the very nature of printmaking itself. Um, I became interested in making work that also reflects the, the perfect symmetry that comes from the action of pulling a print um, from a plate after printing. And the fact that Gampi can be read from both sides um, allows for this kind of um, copying of that of that kind of um, technique because you can flip the images around and create this perfect perfectly symmetrical image. Um, so this is pulling a plate and you can see this is what I really love about pulling um, large pieces of Gampi off, off, uh, off a plate. You get this symmetry, you get this perfect mirror image of your print as it comes off the press. So one of the things I've always really appreciated about moving and living in America is the generosity and openness of the printmaking community. There are a huge amount of opportunities available to artists in America, um, especially printmaking. And I've been lucky enough to have traveled to universities and print shops all over the country 
over the past decade as a visiting artist. A few of the highlights include um, a visit I did to Alfred University in 2017, where I worked with Prof. Joseph Shearer at the Department of Expanded Media, and where I had access to materials and expertise in technologies and mediums that I hadn't had the opportunity to work with before. Um, this is a nine-plate photopolymer print um, that they made. They made all nine plates for me overnight. And I came in in the morning and they were all laid out ready to print. Um, so I printed them on very fine Japanese paper and then Ron, I seen them all together. Um, so the project I was researching when I was at Alfred was how a single image based on a drawing done specifically for this project can be viewed differently depending on which medium you choose and how that changes the perception of the image to the viewer. Of course, the medium you choose, whether it's a woodcut, etching, lithograph, etc., um, to convey the concept or idea of your work is, of course, at the very heart of, of the printmaking process. Following this, oh yes, I forgot to. So, following this residency, I was invited in 2018 to NASCAD in Nova Scotia by Professor Mark Bovey, where I made my first stone lithograph with the Tamarin master printer Jill Graham, who expertly walked me through every stage and was honestly, it was really one of the best experiences I've had. She's an amazing lithographer and um, now a great friend, actually. So we had a lot of fun making this print over two weeks. So this was the finished image, um, and it was a continuation of the same theme that I'd started at Alfred, which documented the bones and remnants of, of the destruction of a series of old warehouses around my studio in San Francisco to make way for million dollar condos. We made a double size print by printing the first half of the stone lithograph and then flipping the paper to extend the image to double its size, making sure that the drawing merged perfectly in the center, creating a lithograph from one stone, which is nearly 200 centimeters long. And it's really thanks to Jill that this worked, especially where we joined it in the middle. That was um, quite tricky and she managed to, I don't know what they do with lithography, it's like magic to me. <laughs> so in October of 2018, I made my second major move, this time for two years and to Slovenia. Slovenia. This move had a very different impact on my practice than my move to America had had. Slovenia is a lovely country in one of the most beautiful parts of the world, and the move has been a really positive one. I was really feeling pretty burned out when I arrived after a really busy exhibition and traveling schedule over the past couple of years in America, um, and not to mention the effect that the current political climate has on everyone that we know in the US. It was, it was quite a good time to take a break, I feel, after 18 years. So moving here gave me time, the time I needed to stop and reevaluate my work and to refresh and reflect and to slow down and most of all to rediscover the importance of drawing in my practice. Having no access to a press enabled me to draw every day for the first six months. This extended time of drawing led me to start working on suites of prints rather than the one-off pieces I had been making when I first moved to America. So this suite of eight large dry points, uh, they're 100 centimeters by 150. I'm sorry about the terrible mock-up, I'm not very good at Photoshop. Um, I printed these at Art Print Residence in Barcelona and still have two left to print. Um, and, it's, and they're based entirely on the drawings that I did for the first six months here in Ljubljana. The images are deliberately more pared down and simplified and abstracted 
concentrating on exposing the structural lines beneath the surfaces of um, the buildings around us. Whilst these dry points look much more uncomplicated than my earlier work, they actually took much longer to resolve as images and as a set. And I had to draw and redraw them until they would work at this scale. But I, I found it quite interesting looking at this set in retrospect, um, because I feel like retrospectively, there's a feeling of isolation and emptiness to them that we saw in cities and towns all over the world as the lockdown started. You know, they're, I feel like they're very isolated um, without people and that sort of thing. Uh, this set is a standalone set within the edition, and I think it's a good example of how paper choices affect the concept of the finished work. The layers in this set represent both the inception of the structure, so like the original blueprint, which is printed on mulberry paper, and hints at the final traces or echoes of the architectural forms over time. The two prints lay over each other, allowing the Gampi to float weightlessly above the more substantial image of the blueprint. And there's one each of these prints to each of the eight prints in the set. In October 2019, I was awarded the Mario Avati Prize for Printmaking from the Académie des Beaux-Arts in Paris. This came with a solo exhibition in Paris in the spring of 2021 at the stunning revamped gallery at, in the building there. Uh, this has meant that my focus for the past year has been completely on making a new body of work for the show and is partly why we have to return to America so that I can start printing again on a large scale. The show will be up on, I think, May the 5th to June the 5th, if anyone's in Paris, come along. So COVID lockdown meant that I could not continue working on the large plates for the Paris exhibition. So a change in scale was needed while I was working from home. I really felt the need to somehow reference what we were all going through without resorting to some kind of contrived imagery that didn't feel authentic or true to me and which was still faithful to the subject matter that I'm interested in. So as COVID spread globally and our social media screens filled with the images of deserted cities and empty streets, this series done from drawings that were originally made as a celebration of all the different European architectural styles became more of a mediation on how our surroundings can suddenly become more fragile than we could have imagined. I decided on making prints using very delicate lines within the format of a circle, floating in space as a symbol of self-containment, isolation, and protection against an unseen threat. So I made all these plates um, during isolation. Each successive drawing evolved almost unconsciously, starting with a more representative image, image, the one on the left, which is based on the Palm House in Vienna, and ending with the final image, originally based on the brutalist architecture of Eastern Europe. But by then, my drawings had sort of morphed unconsciously to resemble a cell or infectious agent like the coronavirus itself. So this, these are the first and last prints in this set. In July this year, when the borders were opened, I managed to get up to Basel to take part in Edition Basel, which is an experimental week-long residency at Druckwerk where they have a very large press and where I created the first of two hanging installations that will, I will show in Paris. I started thinking of the work not only in terms of scale, but as a three-dimensional experience for the viewer. So this print, A Quiet Space, is based on a, the beautiful cast iron structure of a palm house in Citadel Park in Barcelona. I'm not gonna try and say that in Spanish, because it's quite difficult. 
um, what, so what really drew me to this particular building and other similar structures for this new series of installation size works was an interest in, in exploring and expanding on themes of fragility and shelter, protection and renewal. So a quiet space is printed on multiple sheets of the thinnest scampi paper and is designed to hang in the centre of a gallery space opposite a second yet to be made piece. The translucency of the paper allows the image to be viewed from both sides. Um, it's designed so that the movement of people around the piece gently stirs the length of tissue, giving a glimpse of the layers beneath. Um, the scale is a really important element as it recreates that sense of space, time and place. I want the viewer to experience the palpable sense of stillness and peace that I myself felt from spending time here on arrival from America and to stop and rest for a moment in our chaotic world. The Palm House in Sydney is a beautiful modern construction, very different from Barcelona and will be the inspiration for the second piece. In December 2019, I was in Australia during the horrendous fires. With fires again now in California and with floods and pestilence besetting us, ideas of how man-made structures impact nature and are in turn affected by it have become even more central to my work. I will continue to explore these ideas of fragility, fragility and strength, shelter and protection, using printmaking processes and materials to reflect and enhance the subject matter. And finally, in four weeks, I will be returning to San Francisco after an amazing two years in this part of Europe. My future plans are that after my show in Paris in the spring, we will sell our house in San Francisco after 18 years, and I'm planning to move to Sydney, Australia to set up a printmaking residency with the biggest press I can get my hands on. It's the next big move and I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you.